Hello again, this is Matt 2115 coming to you from the College of DuPage, and this is the conclusion of the lecture entitled General Recursive Definitions and Structural Induction. Make sure you're an active learner as you watch this video. Uh, previously, we proved a bunch of uh, things, and now we're going to prove properties about recursively defined sets. So when a set has been defined recursively, uh, this is a version of math induction, but it's called structural induction. And it can be used that every object in the set satisfies a given property. So here's the way it works. Let S be a set that has been defined recursively, and P of X is the property that objects in S may or may not satisfy. To prove that every object in S satisfies P of X, we perform the following step. There's a basis step. Show that P of A is true for each object A in the base for S. Then the inductive step is uh, show that for every X in S, if P of X is true and Y is obtained by applying a rule from the recursion, then P of Y is true. So we suppose that X is an arbitrarily chosen uh, element of S for which P of X is true. Then we show that Y is obtained from X by applying a rule from the recursion. That means that P of Y is true. And the conclusion is, because no steps other than those obtained from the base and recursion are contained in S, steps one and two prove that P of X is true for every X in X. That probably isn't very clear written in this way, but let's do an example. Uh, that will make things much clearer. So suppose S is a set of all integers that are defined recursively as. So this is a set of integers that we, re, we define recursively as. 4 is in S. And given any integer n in S, n plus 3 is also in S. And the restriction is no integers are in S other than those derived from the base and the recursion. So we use structural induction to prove that for every integer n in S, n mod 3 is equal to 1. That means when you divide n by 3, the remainder is 1. So we'll do a proof by structural induction. OK, so um, this is the um, P of n statement. Given an integer n in S, P of n is the statement that n mod 3 is 1. So we're going to show that P of n is true for each integer n in the base. Well, the only thing in the base is 4. And if you divide 4 by 3, you certainly get 1. So that gets checked off. Now what we have to show is for each integer n in S, if P of n is true and if m is, uh, contain, uh, is obtained from n by applying the rule, which was this n plus 3, uh, then um, uh, that uh, P of M has to be true. Well, uh, if we start that, if uh, N is equal to, N mod 3 is equal to 1, that means that um, uh, the, uh, that the uh, remainder when you divide N by 3 is 1. And so that means that N is equal to 3 times K plus 1. When you divide by 3, your quotient will be K, but your remainder will be 1. And so um, that's good. And now we're going to look at, and we have to prove that n plus 3 is also in, uh, in, in um, has that same property. And so uh, n plus 3, mod 3 is, so this is going to be, this is n by the induction hypothesis plus 3. And that's the same thing as 3k plus 4, because I just add 3 and 1. But then that's the same thing as 3k plus 3 plus 1. And so you see this is, so if I divide this by 3, the quotient would be uh, k plus 1, and uh, the remainder would be 1, so that is 1. So we've, uh, means that p of n plus 3 is true, and that was what was to be shown. So the conclusion is, because there are no integers in S other than those obtained from the base and the recursion, each integer in S satisfies the equation n mod 3 equal 1. Uh, here's an example where we talk about a property of a set of parentheses. So we let C be the set of all legal configurations of parentheses. And we talked about this before. And we're going to show that uh, by structural induction that every configuration in C contains an equal number of left and right parentheses. 
Okay, so uh, given any uh, structure x in C, p of x is the sentence x has an equal number of left and right parentheses. Show that p of a is true for each structure that is in the base C. Well, the only object in C from the previous example uh, in the last lecture was this one that has 1 and 1, so that's true, so p of a is true. Then what we're going to do is we're going to uh, show that for each parentheses structure x and C, uh, if p of x is true and y is obtained by applying a rule from the recursion for c, then p of y is true. Now, there were two rules that could happen, and we have to look at both of them. Okay, so uh, we will look at uh, 2a and 2b. So suppose e and f are parentheses structures of c, and p of e and p of f are both true. Uh, in other words, they each have an uh, equal number, so that means that... Um, um, that's in the inductive hypothesis that they have an equal number m of left and right parentheses. So when real root tool is when rule 2a is applied to e, you get uh, e in parentheses. So you add one there and one there, and that is n minus one left and n minus one right. And so since these numbers are equal, p of p parentheses parentheses e is true. And when this one is applied to e and f, the result is e and f. And so that is going to be m plus n left and right parentheses. So p of ef is also true. Thus, when the recursion uh, rules for c are applied to parentheses structures that have an equal number of left and right parentheses, the results also have an equal number of left and right parentheses, which completes the inductive step. Basically, you're approving that, that your compiler checks this thing correctly. Um, so the conclusion is because there are no parentheses structures in C other than those obtained from that, every parentheses structure in C has an equal number of left and right parentheses. A recursive definition can also be given for the length of a string. So uh, this is, again, we talked about the length of a string before, but this is a recursive definition. Um, given the set of all strings over a finite set A, the length of string L in S is defined as follows. The length of the null string is zero. But for every string, the length of, if you add a, um, for every U that is in S and every character in A, the length of UA is one more than the length of U. You just added one character, and so that's L of U plus one. And so the theorem uh, follows that, um, the length, the length of the concatenation of two strings is the sum of the lengths of the two substrings. Okay, so uh, we'll do, uh, again, a proof by structural indu induction. So let us be the set of all strings over a finite set A. Given any string, and that is going to be a uh, V in S, the property is that uh, L of UV equals L of U plus L of V. So we show that this is true for every string. So first we take in our base set for S. The only string in the base set is the null set. And so you do this, and that certainly is true uh, because the length of one is gonna be the length of one, and the length of the null is zero. So that is true for P of lambda. For the null string, that is true. Now suppose that for every X in S, if P of X is true and Y is obtained by applying a rule, this is the rule and p of y is true. So there were three rules that were there. Uh, if you go back and you, you know, look at uh, the rules we had for the strings, there were a, b, and c. Um, but uh, rule 2a is the only one that generates new strings in s. So suppose that uh, v is any string in s such that this is true. That means we're saying this is true. That's our induction hypothesis. So when 2a is applied to v, the result is VC, where C is a character in A. So to complete the induction step, we have to show that this is true. So this is equal to this because of part C of the definition of a string. But you see this, we added just one character, so it's this. But this, by our induction hypothesis, is that. And I can reorganize this because the associate pro uh, property for addition. And I get this by the length of the string. And hence, this is true, which was what was to be shown. 
So, because there are no strings in S other than those obtained through the base and recursion for S, we conclude that every string in S satisfies the additive property for string length. You can also show that the concatenation of any two strings is a string. And I'm going to let you read through that um, yourself. But again, it is by uh, structural induction. You can also show that the concatenation of strings is associative, that this is true. There are other ways to prove it, and I think some of the other ways are more straightforward. We can also talk, though, about functions being defined recursively, or uh, something is a, a recursive function if its definition involves calling itself. Now, you can think about this as subroutines calling themselves, and it can get pretty uh, uh, complicated because all of this is a self-reference. It's sometimes difficult to tell whether a given recursive function is well-defined. And you, if you're writing a program, you want to make sure that it is well-defined. And recursive functions are of great importance of the theory of computation in computer science. So here's an example of a recursive function. This is called McCarthy's 91 function. And so here, capital M of n is equal to, and it's a piecewise function. It is n minus 10 if n is bigger than 100, but it is m of m of m plus 11 if n is less than or equal to 1. Find m of 99. Okay, so m of 99 is less than 100, so we use that bottom definition, so we get this. So that is m of, but m of 110, uh, that's bigger and so that than 100, so that is just going to be m of 100. But since 100 is less than or equal to 100, this is, by this one, m of m of 111. But since 111 is larger, this is m of 101. That's bigger than 100, so that is 91. Now, the remarkable thing about this function is you always get 91. And you may want to think about proving that uh, for any number that is, if you start with any number that is less than or equal to 100. It's n minus 10, otherwise by definition. Another such recursive function is called the Ackerman function. And um, so here's how it works. And it's a function of two variables. So we say a of 0n is equal to n plus 1. a of m 0 is a of m minus 1 comma 1 and a of n m is a of m minus 1 and here we have a recursive call a of m comma n minus 1 and we want you to find a of 1 2. This kind of calculation is something I could ask you to do on a, on a test. I think this is maybe the best way to test this whole section. So let's talk about this a of 1 2. <coughs> so a of 1 2 then is equal to, by this part of the definition, a of 0 and a of 1, 1. But a of 1, 1, using this definition again, is, so I leave the 0 there, but this is a of 0, comma, a of 1, 0. Again, using that definition. But a of 0, a of, uh, a of 1, 0 is this one. So that is a of 0, 1. So this is a of 0, a of 0, 2. This is a of 0, 3. And a of 0, 3 is n plus 1, that is 4. Now the special properties of this function are a consequence of its very high growth rate. Uh, and in fact, uh, it can be shown that it grows very, very fast. a 4, 4 is 2 to the 2 to the all, all of those. And so they just uh, increase with very rapid things. And so that's one of the features of the Ackerman function. Again, I expect you to be able to do calculations like this. So um, practice uh, these kind of problems.
Now you can show that the Ackermann function is well defined. You always get an answer. But now I'm going to give you an example of a recursive definition that does not define a function. So suppose we consider a recursive function z to be g of n is equal to 1 if n is 1, is 1 plus g of n over 2 if n is even, and it is g of 3n minus 1 if n is odd and greater than 1. Is it well defined? Well, it turns out we have a counterexample because, uh, and we start going and we figure out what g of 1, g of 2, g of 3, and g of 4 are. You should check this and make sure that you can follow these calculations. However, g of 5 is going to be, um, so, so 5 is odd, so I take 3 times 5 minus 1, that is g of 14. But g of 14, since it is even, is 1 plus g of 7. And since 7 is odd, 3 times 7 is uh, 21 minus 1, so that is 1 plus g of 20. Now 1 plus, and, and g of 20 is, since it's even, it's 1 plus g of 10. So this is going to be 1 plus, and this is going to be 1 plus 1 plus g of 5, which is, if you do that, that is 3 plus g of 5. So look, g of 5 is 3 plus g of 5. Subtracting g of 5 from both sides gives 0 equal 3, which is false. So if we assume that this is a function, we get a false statement, so g is not a well-defined function. Now, it's interesting to note that a slight modification of the formula in that example does produce a function um, whose status is actually not known. This is an open research question. Consider the following formula. t of n is equal to 1 if n is 1. It is t of n over 2 if n is even and is t of 3n plus 1 if n is odd. Um, Kolzatz, a student, was interested in this, and uh, he considered a related function that is g of n is n over 2 if n is even, and it's 3n plus 1 if n is odd. And you can see it's similar to this one. He conjectured that for any initial value n, if you computed, g, g squared, meaning g composed with g, g cubed, g composed with g, composed with g, and so on, eventually it would produce the number 1. Now, it's never been determined if his conjecture, which was a guess, is true or false. This is called the 3n plus 1 problem. You could be famous if you solved this. Uh, now, if this conjecture is true, then the formula for t up here does define a function. If it's false, t is not well defined. This answer is not known, although People have done computer calculations and established this is holds for extremely large values of n. It probably is true, and again, if you want to become famous, you can prove this. Uh, but in closing for now, more than ever, time is precious. Each day must count. Do the math. It will make you strong. And now more than ever, take care of yourself and of each other. God bless you all.